Good morning. How's everybody today? Good to see everybody can make it out today. It's, it's another lovely day, isn't it? <laughs> Any day God gives us is a good day, isn't it? It's it's sort of uh, sort of messy out there and cold, but you know what? Before long, it'll be spring again, and uh, it'll start to warm back up, and good things will happen, right? But uh, winter's part of life, isn't it? Part of life, but. But I enjoy some of that too, don't you? I do. But, you know, the Bible says good things come, or there's a lot of places in the Bible should say, wait on the Lord, right? And he'll provide, if, it, if it's not what you want, he'll provide something better, I think, don't you? Um, wait on the Lord. Hey, I got a good, you want to hear a story this morning? Good, I'm glad you do. <laughs> I've got a really good real-life story for wait on the Lord. Really good, real life story. And for my case, something really good, okay? I was a sophomore in high school, and I got to know this little girl. She was a senior in high school, an older woman. <laughs> and uh, I really liked this little girl, but I'm not sure the little girl quite saw it that way. So few years passes, this little girl's at UT, and eventually I'm at UT, and I, I still like this little girl. The only problem is I'm not sure that little girl quite saw it that way. More years pass. She takes a job at a plant in North Georgia, and I'm singing at that time. We're singing in Georgia, and our paths cross again, and I finally asked that little girl out. And nine months later, that little girl married me. <laughs> I married the only girl I ever dated. It took me seven years to get a date. <laughs> That's a true story. Isn't that right, Leanne? That's a true story. Now, I, I was kidding, you know, when I told you I hide her Christmas presents in the oven. We're not cooking people, okay? But that was a little stretch, okay. She goes, I hope they didn't believe that. <laughs> I said, I don't think they believed it 100%. We do flip it on sometimes. But don't catch a house on fire. <laughs> but anyway, that's a true real-life story, okay. I know you feel better knowing that, right? Anyway, I want to I ask Bill and Tanya if they would come up front here. You got something to give Bill this morning? Just a little token of thanks from the church for... All his hard work, and I know, uh, I know how stressful it is uh, uh, being in leadership in a church, but especially being a pastor. Uh, you know, a lot of times as a pastor, we don't we don't just get phone calls. We're saying, "Boy, I hope you have a good day." You know, I hope hope things are going great. You know, a lot of times it's people are going through troubles in life, all kinds of troubles, and you have to you have to carry those burdens for people. So we just want to thank Bill for his hard work and dedication to the church. Wish him and Tanya the, the best of best Christmas ever. Let's give them a big hand. If you would. Thank you. Okay, those of you like this morning, stand and sing along with us. We're going to sing, Jesus is Precious. When I feel disheartened, forsaken, forgotten, Jesus is precious to me. Jesus is precious to me. Jesus is precious. He is so precious. Jesus is precious to me. He is my Savior, my Lord. Is 
is precious to me. He's comfort in sorrow. He's hope for tomorrow. Jesus is precious to me. He's all sing since Jesus passed by. Sing along with us this morning.
What's the bill say? Radically change your life, right? Amen. Well, it's good to be here. Amen? Amen. Glad to see each one of you out this morning. So glad we can join together and worship the Lord. And uh, so thankful for each one of you who have come this morning. And I pray that you'll have a blessed day. I pray that your heart will be in tune as you receive the word of God this morning. If you have a prayer request or if there's a guest today or if you have something on your heart, take out one of those cards connection card fill it out and bring it to me at the end of the service and let us pray for you there's a guest here today take a moment fill that card out we want to know you're here but more than anything we want God to just speak to us God to come down and rend the heavens and come down and move across this congregation this morning amen and we got want God to have his way and we want him to have his will in your life and we want God to move and we want God to bless and we want God to speak and he will uh, he'll speak through his word this morning, and we have to pray, God, give me a heart to know you. Give me a heart to receive the message uh, that you have for me this morning. So prepare your hearts, church, as we heed and hear God's voice and God speak to us today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day you've given us. Thank you that you passed by my way one day. Uh, Lord, when I was 18 years old, you radically changed my life. Uh, you passed by. And you showed me uh, that I was a great sinner and that you were a great Savior. And I pray this morning if there's a need in this congregation, if there's a need as families and folks are sitting around this building today, I pray God you'd speak to their heart and encourage them with your word and call them to yourself, Father. Holy Spirit, you come down and you move across this place. Uh, Father, rend the heavens and come down. Uh, that we might see you in all of your power and all of your glory and all of your might. That we might see you in all of your holiness. God, speak today, we pray. And God, move us closer to you, Father. Draw us to the place uh, where, there, where sins are forgiven. Draw us to the place where hope is found. Draw us, Father, to the place, the foot of the cross, where life is found this morning. And I pray, Father, that all over this building, moms and dads and uh, grandmas and grandpas and young people will get their hearts right with you, that they'll draw near to you, that they'll find joy in the Lord, they'll find joy in you this morning, they'll find real peace in you this morning. I pray, God, today that there are needs that n nobody knows but you, Father, they have no idea what's going through a heart and a life that's sitting here today. Somebody might be broken. They might be discouraged. They might be lonely. Father, we know that you're the one who hears us. You're the one who can help. You're the one that makes the ultimate difference in lives for eternity. And even right now, this morning. And I pray today, Father, you'll give us words to say and give us ears to hear. And hearts to obey what you have for us. Oh, thank you that we can lift our voices together in song, praising our precious Savior today. Thank you for the Lamb of God who's taken away our sin. And Father, move on this place that we might come in here to worship you in spirit and truth and go out to serve you and tell the world that Jesus saves. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. If you agree with that, will you say amen this morning? Amen. amen. You may be seated. I know you all know I love this song, Grace. I love songs about grace. And uh, I know you probably know it, but sing along with me this morning. But don't sing it like you know it. Sing it like you feel it, okay? Sing along with me.
good to feel the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Amen. That would make you want to preach a little bit, Bill. Come on up here, buddy. <laughs> These, man, they primed the pump this morning. And it is good. Y'all okay? I don't know anybody else having a good time. I sure am this morning. Ah, man, it's so good. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jerry and Daniel. Thank you for uh, stirring our souls. And uh, I, it feels good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, I hope uh, and pray, looking forward to a great time, and after the service, we want everybody to stay, join us for lunch today, and it's, we'll fellowship and, uh, and gather around uh, at the table and uh, celebrate after we worship today. Uh, do, do take time, our, our, our holiday schedule has been posted, and uh, we will be having a service on Christmas morning, so... Uh, I'm telling you, don't stay home. You need to be here on Christmas Day. Bring your whole family and gather in the house of the Lord. You can open presents before or after, but come and be here. Bring the whole family and be here on Sunday, on Christmas Day. We're looking forward to a great day. There's going to be a special songs, and I'll be preaching. Uh, there'll be no, uh, no life groups, no children's church, but we're going to gather here as families and worship the Lord. That's, that sounds good. Amen. Amen. I want to preach a t- message entitled, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the Perishing. Fanny Crosby wrote a song entitled, Rescue the Perishing. That's where I borrowed my sermon title for this morning. Part of that hymn says, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying. Weep for our erring one. Lift up the fallen one, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Oh, Jesus is mighty to save today. Jesus is mighty to save, and he wants you and I to be God's instruments to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. We have the privilege of being a part of God's plan to extend grace to those who are perishing. Jude's words here in the book of Jude, if you have your Bibles, we encourage you to turn there and keep them open. These words remind us of that opportunity and that privilege that God has given us. Uh, If you notice, if you remember last Sunday, we'll begin reading again in verse 17. And Jude has been calling the church to contend for the faith. And he tells us how to do that. Uh, He says in verse 17, let me begin reading there. He says, but beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of Of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion making a difference. And others save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. And I said a great big amen this morning. Rescue the perishing. Now Jew, this morning is a book, as you've been reminded as we preach through this letter, this short New Testament postcard, Jude is a book that tells us that we are to contend for the faith that's been once delivered to the saints. That's what he says in Jude, Jude verse number 3. And Jude is a book that tells us that we must be doctrinally orthodox. 
that we must believe the right way. Uh, but beloved, when we believe the right way, listen to me, when we believe the right way, if we truly believe right, then we'll behave right, we'll live right. And one of the things that Jude contends and brings to us this morning is that when we live in this world, there's false teachers that could come in. And here's the danger. Here's the danger. When we hear that news about those coming in, these men, these men who are facing the judgment of God, who would seek to draw people away from the faith, we might get worried and begin to wring our hands in worry and fear. Or when you look at the culture and you look at these, these things that Jude's been talking about, not only we, we might wring our hands in worry, but we also might, we might want to wash our hands and discuss and just say, forget the world, forget this culture. But that's not what God's called us to. We are not to wring our hands in worry and fear. We are to guard the gospel and, and protect it and guard it and stand for the truth. But we're not to worry and fear. And we're not to wring our hands in disgust as we look at the conditions of our world. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to reach out our hands in compassion and love and rescue the perishing. We're to reach out with compassion and mercy. And the love of Christ will compel us. The love of Christ will compel us to go to a lost world. And to go to, to all kinds of people. And uh, from every nationality and every ethnic and every racial and social group. And, and he tells us we need to reach out with compassion and mercy. Because there's folks that need, they're perishing Without the gospel of Christ. They are, uh, they are, if you notice in your Bibles, he said, and of some, verse 22, and of some have compassion making a difference. And others save with fear, uh, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, if you were Jude's audience, they would have, quick, they would have quickly recognized where these these contending words that we've been talking about are, are, are from. Uh, we've already talked about building, and we've talked about mercy. And, and if, you go to the, if you go to the Old Testament, to the book of Zechariah, there uh, the prophet Zechariah had received a, a series of visions that, uh, that contained similar words that Jude's using as he writes his letter. And in, Jude, in Zechariah's first vision, he says... He uses the words that God would use. But here the difference is that God is the one who's going to build. In Zechariah chapter 1 it says, Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And so Zechariah got this, this vision from God that says God's going to build and God's going to come with mercy. And God's going to build and bring his people back together. God's bringing mercy with him. And God's building his people again. But then Zechariah still receives another vision. And in that vision it says, and these words are closely tied to our text this morning. It says in Zechariah chapter 3, he said, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. By the way, uh, by the, way the uh, Hebrew name for Jesus is Joshua. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has, who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from you. From him, And to him he said, Behold, I've taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I, I will bring my servant the branch, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. 
In that day that declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Zechariah said there's coming a day when God will build and God will bring mercy. And in a single day, our iniquities will be removed. And you know what the result of that work being? He says, everybody, everybody who, who, who receives that mercy and, and receives God's grace. He said, every one of us will invite our neighbors to come sit under his fig tree, under his vine. Amen. Amen. And, and, and Zechariah said, God said, I'm going to be like those. I'm going to pluck those who are, who, are, who are like brands in the fire. I'm going to snatch them out of the fire and give them mercy and give them grace. God comes with his mercy and his grace to give filthy garments, to turn filthy garments into pure vestments. And that means that God's work has been, uh, 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 of, of, of grace has been given to us. Jesus, who is our high priest, came to build and show mercy. And he's called us not to merely endure sinners. You and I are a part of God's plan to see them saved. We are not here to mer- mer- merely put up with, uh, with those who are, who are near the fire, but we're called by God to snatch them from the fires of hell. And, and, and contending for the faith that's once delivered to the saints means that we're telling, uh, we're, we're contending and compassionate, reaching out the hand of mercy to a world that needs Christ. I remember a preacher telling a story. And he said that in his study or in the study of a particular pastor, there was a painting. The painting was the painting of a ship that was sinking. And the ship had already gone down. The lifeboats were out on the water and the people were in the water. And this particular lifeboat that was painted had a a man leaning over over the railing of the lifeboat. And he's extending his hand to one, uh, one of the people in the water swimming around. And the man in the water is lifting his hand up. And their hands are about to meet in this painting. And a little boy who had not yet started school came in. And he looked at that picture. And of course the picture was to illustrate to rescue the perishing. And to care for the dying. And the little boy studied that picture. And he looked at it for a while. And then he asked his daddy the question. He said daddy is that man trying to save those people? Or is he just shaking hands with them? And every preacher ought to ask themselves that question. And every Christian who's sitting in this congregation this morning. Ought to ask ourselves this question. That the people you shook hands with this morning. Or the people you'll shake hands with this week. Are we simply, are we, are we trying to reach out with the compassion and the love of Christ to rescue them from, uh, from those, those waters of death and the grave? Or are we just shaking hands with folks? Are we really... Are we really endeavoring to bring people to Jesus Christ? Man, my soul was stirred as I studied this week. And my heart was stirred as I thought, as we sung about grace this morning. Grace is so wonderful, isn't it? Amen. Isn't it marvelous? Marvelous grace. Y'all okay this morning? We sang about the marvelous grace of God, but... Listen, we fail if we don't 
if we don't reach out with compassion and love to a world to rescue the perishing and care for the dying, it, we, we who have received the mercy of God, we are, we are called by God to extend the hand of mercy and grace to those who need it. Amen? I mean, think about that. When the angel visited Mary and told Mary she was going to have a son, the angel said to Mary in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, Thou shalt call his name, what? Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. The angel said, the one who's coming, his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus said of himself, Jesus said, being the supreme example of what it, uh, of reaching out, the one God sent, he said he came to do what? To seek and to save those who are what? Lost. And then Jesus gave the great commission to the church to go make, and he said, go make disciples of all the nations. And did you know that commission was not a suggestion, it was a command? Nod your head like this. It was not a suggestion, it was a command. It was not a request, it was a command. And the church, or the Christian who is endeavoring to do what God has commanded, it's not just missing the blessing of being someone who leads others to Christ. It, we're being disobedient if we don't seek to bring others to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We must heed Jude's words. We are to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. We are to pray in the Holy Ghost. We are to keep ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to come. But we must do what verses 22 and 23 tell us this morning. We must reach what I would consider three groups of people that he mentions here. Three groups that we must seek to reach out and rescue. He says, first of all, in verse 22, we are to deal gently with those who doubt. We are to deal gently with those who doubt. He says, again, notice the context. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Now, what does the word compassion mean anyway? Well, the word compassion comes from a Latin word, which means C-O-M, means with. And the, and, and the latter part of that phrase means to suffer. And so he says, on some we ought to have compassion. And so when a person has compassion, he puts himself in the place of another. That means when we have compassion, we're moved with the feeling of that person. We can feel what that person feels. We suffer as they suffer. We identify with their doubts and their brokenness. And he says, those who are doubting, and if some have compassion, making a difference, these folks are doubting and they're, 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 they're like sheep without a shepherd. And I remember what it says of Jesus in Matthew 9. When Jesus speaks, he said, it says of our Lord, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with what? With compassion. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus saw the multitude marching on their way to hell. And Jesus swept tears over them. And Jude says those who are doubting, they're wavering. We can make a difference. And, and they are under the influence of false teaching. Uh, but uh, they, are, they are doubting. But we're not called to reject them or ignore them. We're called by God to reach out to them and gently call them back to the truth. Uh, he says... If we've received the mercy of God, we are to show 
the mercy of God to others. He says, deal gently with those who doubt. Now, I'm going to say something this morning. And I'm going to say something that's going to sound really mean. It's going to sound mean. But it's not mean. And it's not something that I just simply thought up while I was standing up here. I have thought about it. And it's not something I'm saying off the top of my head that I haven't given a great much deal of thought this morning. But I'm going to say something that's going to sound mean to you. But it's not mean. I'm going to say this. Now listen to me. If you don't care about people being saved. If you are not concerned about bringing the lost to Jesus Christ. I'm going to say something that's going to sound mean. I doubt. I doubt seriously that you're truly a Christian. I doubt very seriously that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us to rescue the perishing. To care for the dying. And those he says, Jude says, uh, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And, and truthfully, listen, listen this morning. We do not know the kind of difference that we can make in someone's life if we lovingly reach out to them. They may be doubting. They may, may be uh, influenced by those, the truth and the, the voices of our culture. And they may be doubting the love of God and doubting the truth of Scripture. But, but Jude says, let's reach out and deal with the doubting gently. That we might make a difference in their life. Over in England, a preacher stood up to give a testimony with his preacher brethren. And he said, gentlemen, many years ago, there came into our home a little bundle from heaven. A little boy for whom we had prayed. A precious baby boy. He was, so far as we could tell, perfect in every way. But he said, when that boy got to be about three years of age, that little fellow grew sick. He said, we carried him to the doctors. And he had a strange sickness. The doctors said they were not able to be properly diagnose it. And they didn't know what was wrong. And, he, and over time, he grew increasingly sick. And, he, and so we just brought him home from the hospital. Because he might as well die at home if there's nothing that they can do to help our little boy. One day the doctor came to the house and the little boy grew very, very weak. And finally the doctor reached out uh, for the vital signs and he put his hands there to feel the pulse. And the doctor looked up and said, he's gone, he's dead. Our little boy was gone. And the preacher said, at that moment I told my wife, bring some warm blankets he said, I ripped off my coat, I ripped off my shirt, and I took, I took the body of our three-year-old little boy, and I put him in my bosom, I wrapped him in those warm blankets, and I held him to my heart, and I prayed for him. And for nine solid hours, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And he said, sirs, today, that little boy, is 23 years old. He's a senior in college. And he's actively serving the Lord Jesus. And I thought, man, when I heard that story, you know what popped into my heart? I said, we need to be like that man who takes the world in our arms and brings it close to our heart. And with compassion and prayer, we need to reach out and pray and pray and go and give and love it with compassion to a world that needs the life that only Jesus can bring. We need that. We need that this morning. 
And I find myself asking the question, do we care? Souls are dying, lost without Christ, and do we really care? He says, deal gently with those who doubt. Jude calls us to have mercy on those who doubt. To show the kindness and compassion, mercy and concern. To encourage them to the truth and patiently point them to Jesus and his all-sufficiency. That brings me to my second group. The second group faces a the second group faces even more a more a serious issue. Look in, look in your Bibles there again. He says in verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the what? The fire. Pulling them out of the fire. So closely is this second group that they are, they are so close. They are near the fires of hell and they are near the final time of eternal condemnation. And Jude quickly interjects. He says, save others by snatching them from the fire. He says, be quick. I don't want you to miss the urgency in Jude's voice. He says, be quick. There's an urgency. It's almost too late, Jude says. They're almost too far gone. He says, there's still time to rescue them, but we must act now. We must act now. I kind of imagine as I've gone through this series, the, the, as Jude, I, I use my sanctified imagination, if you will, and I could imagine Jude writing these words with urgency in his heart to the church and with a tear in his eye saying, we need to reach out and deal quickly with those who are in danger because they are headed to hell. Let me ask you a question. If you were on the way home and you were to see a burning building and in that burning building you were to see a child about to be engulfed by the flames and when you saw that, had you, had you, if you had an opportunity to go into that building and rescue that child, wouldn't you feel a compulsion and a responsibility to go in and try to rescue that child from the flame? Nod your head like this this morning. You'd go, wouldn't you? I would go. I mean, you go snatch a child from those flames, or a man, or a woman, or, a, uh, or anybody for that matter, from the fire. You're going to go in, and you're going to try to rescue them. Would, would you not do that this morning? Would you not go in, at the, even at the cost or the, uh, or, the, or, or the perishing of your own life, wouldn't you want to go in and save someone? Who was about to perish in the fire. What do you think the fire he's talking about here in verse 23 is? Hell. Look at verse 7. Look what he says in verse 7. Behold he comes with clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. Oh, excuse me. I'm reading the wrong verse 7. I'm reading Revelation 1 7. Y'all okay? That's a good verse but it's the wrong one. It says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God rained fire and brimstone from heaven on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And listen to me, but that wasn't the worst fire that came down from heaven. Do you know what the worst fire is? The worst fire is that the, the people, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah are now suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They're being tormented in those flames. You know, sometimes I know when a preacher preaches about hell and the agonies of hell, he's accused of being a sensationalist or he is accused of being non-loving or he's accused of of being uneducated. 
But I'm here to tell you, hell is not a popular subject in our day. As a matter of fact, people don't want to talk about hell, do they? Uh, they don't want to talk about it. They don't even want to think about it. And many, I'm just going to say, many in our, in me, even in our churches, some of our churches in America act as if hell's not real. They think that if we ignore it, it will just go away. But I'm going to quote a preacher. Can I quote a preacher? He's what I think he's the greatest preacher that's ever preached the word. You know what his name is? His name's Jesus. And Jesus said, I want you to hear Jesus' words this morning. Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which can kill the body, but, not, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 13, verses 41 and 42, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus said, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Billy Graham used to say that Heaven is a prepared place. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there shall you be also. But Jesus also said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I'm here to tell you, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. But hell is a prepared place for an unprepared people. And Jesus, and Jude is saying to the church, deal gently with those who are doubting, but deal quickly with those who are in danger. Because they are those that need to be snatched as like firebrands out of the fire. I'm going to say something. I hope it will stick with you this morning. We must never forget, as long as we live, As long as we live, this truth, given enough time, every person will one day believe in hell. Missionary by the name of C.T. Studd was a Cambridge educated student. But when he was a student at Cambridge, God radically changed C.T. Studd's heart. He was noted to be one of the greatest cricket players of his day. He was on the same level as Babe Ruth in a different sport, Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. But God radically changed C.T. Studd's heart. And he was known, he was one of seven Cambridge students who went to the mission field. And he decided to leave the comforts of England and went to the mission fields and there he would die as an old man in the mission field in Africa. But C.T. Sud said this about giving his life for the, for the advancement of the kingdom, the advancement of the gospel. This is what he said. He said, some want to live within the sound of church and chapel bell. He said, I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. I like that, don't you? He said, I want to rescue the perishing. I want to snatch those who are in danger from the fire. I want to rescue the perishing. I want to care the dying thirdly 
And finally, I want you to notice this last group, and they're in the worst shape of all. Their condition is the most severe. And Jude says we must deal carefully with those who are defiled. We must deal carefully with those who are defiled. We need to deal gently with those who doubt. We need to deal quickly with those who are in danger. And we need to deal deal carefully with those who are defiled. Notice what he says. He says there in your last, last part of verse 23. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. This last group are folks who have already bought in to the false teachers. Their lives were corrupted, uh, both in how they think and how they live. They are corrupt. They are defiled. They are depraved. They are in danger. They are a danger to themselves and to others. And Jude sends the church a warning. A warning. And the word picture is very vivid and striking. He says, sin has stained and contaminated these folks. Love them, he says, show mercy to them, but don't get too close. For even their clothes can defile you if you're not careful. The word garment there is a, in the Greek is, comes from a word which speaks of the tunic, that inner cloak that was worn. Uh, it'd be like your, it'd be like your unders, right? That inner garment. And he says, he says, sin has broken out like a disease. And and if you think back in those in the Old Testament, when a when a leper had leprosy, it, it's the same picture. They couldn't, they were separated from the camp. And whenever a leper would get uh, would get close, they would have to cry out in the Old Testament, unclean, unclean, unclean. But you know what was the truth about lepers? God loved lepers. God did. And the Leviticus, the garment, that undergarment, uh, they, were, uh, they were to burn that un- undergarment. They, they, they were to burn it. And they were separated. And God's saying we ought to still reach those who are defiled. We have to reach them, but not at the expense of of compromise. I heard this is I don't think this is the original thought. I don't have I, I, I have about two original thoughts, I think. But I heard somebody say this, it's so profound, it stuck me with all these years. And they said, they said, listen, when we reach people who are they are they are sinners, they like you and I, we're sinners in need of grace. They are defiled, they are depraved, but listen to me, listen to me. You cannot make yourself sick in order to make them well. Are you listening to me? You cannot make them sick, make yourself sick in order to make them well. And he says there's a warning. And it's a lie. Now listen to me, it's a lie. Satan says we have to live like the lost in order to reach the lost. And I'm here to tell you that is a lie. They say, Satan says you got to live like them to reach them. I, I can drink like them. I can curse like them. I can party like them. I can be like them. And then I'll be able to reach them. And I'm here to tell you, if you do that, you will never reach them. You'll never reach them. As a matter of fact, in my own life, person, my own personal testimony, I used to run like, like the wind. I used to run with the boys, curse like them, drink like them, party like them. But when God radically changed my life, listen to me, I left that life behind. And God changed my life. And when people began to hear about what God had done in my life, when I was 18 years old, you know what they say, man, what's different about you? What's different? I even remember after I first got saved, I was pledging in a fraternity at UT. And I was, uh, 
I had went to a party. I, I, I was just a new Christian. I went to a party there at the frat house, and I, I, I got something to drink, and I took a sip of it and, I, and it, and I thought, man, this is not right. It's not right. And I put it down, and I left. And I went to see Tanya at the time. We were still dating. Y'all okay? And, and I went in, and, she, and uh, her dad was there, and, and I popped in, and they were heading to bed, I think, as I recall. And, and she smelled my breath, and she says, you need to go home. You've been drinking. And her dad had to know, but he didn't say anything. And I went home. And the next day after that happened, I went down to the frat house and I told those guys, I said, I can't be a pledge anymore. I, 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 I said, Christ has saved me and he's radically changed my life. And he has called me to live a different life. To live separated from the world. To live for the glory of Christ in obedience to his word. And I can't, I can't do these things anymore. And you know what he looked at me and said? He said, I appreciate that. And I can see that God has made a difference in your life. When God saves you, listen, in order to reach a world that's defiled by sin, you cannot live like the world. You've got to live separate and different from the world. Can I get amen this morning? You see, those folks that I used to run with, my witness opened up when I began to live differently in front of them. The truth of the change that had taken place in my life could only be explained by the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. Me coming to Jesus did not terminate our friendship. The danger is this morning, some of us say, you know, Pastor, I don't have any lost friends. That's a shame. Can I just say that? That's a shame. I live separate, so I live so separate that I don't have any lost friends. That's a shame this morning. And you say, well, Pastor, Jesus was the friend of sinners. Oh, yes, he was, but Jesus never sinned, did he? He was holy. We're called to be friends of sinners, but we have to be holy. And when they look at your life, they need to say, what happened to him? What happened to her? In mercy and love, we can then tell them about Jesus. He says... On others, hating even the garment spotted, polluted by the flesh. Lost people matter to God. And therefore, lost people should matter to us. Amen. I'm going to close. Jerry, if you want to come, and Alan. This morning... Let's never give the impression that it doesn't matter whether someone turns to Christ or not. And let's acknowledge this morning that time is passing and decisions are being made that affect lives and families for all eternity. I close with a story, and I'll be through. Martin Niemöller, I've shared this story before, but it's one that I come back to so often. Martin Niemöller was a Lutheran pastor who was imprisoned by the Nazis during World War II. He told, a hor he told one day about a horrible dream that he had one night in the concentration camp. He heard the voice of God ask, what's your excuse? And a voice behind him answered, no one ever told me about Jesus. Niemöller awakened in a sweat that night. 
And he recognized the voice of the responder as Adolf Hitler. Niemöller will remember that in the mid-30s he had been seated at a banquet with Hitler right beside him for several hours. And they just made small talk the whole night. He thought maybe he would just befriend Hitler and talk about the Lord at some other more convenient time. But the more convenient time never came. An anonymous poem passed on to me expressed this need well. It's called My Friend. My friend, it says, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth, I walk with you day by day and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safe to him. Though we lived together here on earth, you never told me of his second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you, but I learn now that it's too late and you could have kept me from this fate. We walk by day and talk by night, and yet you showed me not the light. Yet you live you let me live and love and die. You knew I never li- that I would never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life and trusted you through joy and strife. And yet on coming to this dreadful end, I cannot now call you my friend. You know what the greatest thing we'll ever hear when we get to heaven? You know what the greatest thing we'll ever hear when we get to heaven is? The greatest thing we'll ever hear is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But you know what I think the second greatest thing I think we'll hear? You know what I think it will be? I think it will be the words of a friend who says, thank you. I'm here because you invited me. I'm here because you invited me here. This morning, we don't know how much of a difference we can make in somebody's life by inviting them to church or inviting them to lunch to tell them your testimony. Or praying for them that God would open up their eyes and then give you the opportunity to share the gospel as God speaks to their heart. We'll never know what kind of a difference we can make by inviting someone to a life group or a worship service or taking something and showing the compassion and love of Christ. We might not know the difference that we can make, but I'm telling you, we must try. We must rescue the perishing. We must care for the dying. That call, that commission, that mandate, that command, it's for every one of us. Every you, me, me, you, us, as God's children. We must be concerned. We must have a compulsion to reach our world for Christ. Hey guys, you want to reach your buddies for Christ? You can't act like them. You've got to live differently from them. Moms and dads, you want to see your children come to Jesus? You need to pray over them and bring them to the house of God and disciple them and love them and point them to Jesus day by day and live out the gospel in front of them you have to live out the gospel in front of them that they see Jesus in you you got to live differently you got to be different we have to love different 
We have to pray different. We have to go different. We have to do it because Jesus has commanded us to do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for these words. God, help us to be those who rescue the perishing and care for the dying and tell them that you are mighty to save. Father, forgive us where we have failed you and fallen short. Forgive us for our sins of silence. Father, forgive us for even Christmas, the season that we are in. It's a season to tell the world that his name is Jesus. And he came to save his people from their sins. He came to bring grace. Grace came down. Grace came down to save our souls. And Father, I pray today if there's someone here that doesn't know Christ, that they would heed the voice of the scriptures, the voice of the Holy Spirit. It says, listen, there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. But we must repent of our sins and trust Jesus Christ and say, Jesus is Lord or we'll perish in those flames. I pray today, Father, you would raise up an army of soul winners out of this, out of this, rescue, uh, this rescue chapel. God, let us be those who we sit a yard from hell and let us bring others because we're just beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. God, help us to be obedient to you. God, help us to walk, to be different, to live differently, to love differently than the world, that they might see the light of Christ in us. For the glory of Jesus' name, we pray it all. And all of, all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand today. You sing. Let's sing together. Good day. You come. God is so good to us. Ah, these are our good friends, and they've been coming for all this is Rex and Brenda Patton. And God sent them here, and uh, God has led them to come today on the promise of a letter from Clear Springs Baptist Church to unite with Texas Valley. And uh, we love Brenda and Rex so much. Uh, we've known them for years. We've prayed with them. We've prayed for them. And we're so thankful that they have come here to plant their lives and us work together till Jesus calls us home. Amen. And so on the promise of that letter from Clear Springs, would you just uh, affirm with a motion in a second that we're going to receive this couple into our faith family. And you're going to also do that. You're going to be saying, 
when we do that is all you're also saying oh, we're going to pray uh, for them that God would use them to make a difference and an impact on their world and for the kingdom of God can I get a motion and a second uh, all in favor say amen. amen any opposed I knew it I knew it would be 100 percent I knew it was it was never in doubt and oh it's good uh, man, isn't God good? Let's praise the Lord for, for it. You know, God, God keeps blessing us and sending us good folks, and we're so thankful that he is. Uh, he, he, uh, you know, we water, we plant, but it's God who is the one who brings the growth, and uh, God has been good to uh, give us growth in these days. Uh, and I was telling some of the other, you know, we had seven people join in November and one baptized and now we've started December, and God's done it again. So praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Uh, hey, we've had guests here in recent days. We had folks here last Sunday. They Hopefully those folks will continue to come back. Keep reaching, folks. You're doing it. Uh, keep reaching out to folks and loving on them and inviting them, them and investing in them and telling them, you know, we love, we really do love each other down here at Texas Valley. Amen. And we'll love on them, too. And uh, we'll invite them to find a place or a home as God leads for them to use their gifts and, and service to our Lord until we, until, we, until we finish our race. Amen. I was thinking before I close, and I know we need to eat lunch, and I know the ladies are probably waiting on us, but give me one, give me two minutes. Uh, just so you know, you know, I'm not asking you this morning in that message to do anything that I'm not doing myself. That I'm not already doing myself. This week, we had a couple of folks that I am friends with, peers from another lab in Washington. They were here this week, and we sat, we sat Wednesday at lunch, and I know that one of them, one of those gentlemen, he and I have already connected. Uh, he goes to a Baptist church out in Richland, Washington. Uh, he is a believer. I've spent time at his home. I've been to Washington. I've ate dinner in his home with him and his wife. He is, he is saved as a follower of Christ, but I didn't know about the other lady that came with him. Uh, but I shared my testimony at lunch. We sat down at lunch in the cafeteria. And I shared what God had done in my life when I was 18. How God had called me to preach. What God was doing in my life. What God was doing in the life of our church. And I printed the gospel. And I found out that her name is Sandy. Sandy's a Christian. Uh, she is trusting Christ. But I didn't know until then. And, uh, and, and that's what I did. I, I wanted you to know that this week I'm trying to do exactly what I'm calling us all to is to rescue the perishing and care for the dying. Just reach out. Love on folks, would you? Tell them about Jesus. He's made a difference in your life. If he saved you, he really has an eternal difference. Amen? And that news is meant to be shared. And that, that news is meant to be seen. And how we live and how we love. And how we go about our day, our day where we live, work, and play. Let's make Jesus. Uh, let's shine brightly in our world. Amen? Amen. Amen. If there's, there's prayer requests this morning, I know I got a couple. Uh, I know uh, Kenley's uh, sister-in-law, uh, it's her husband's sister. She has stage four breast cancer. She's young. She's in her 30s, right? Uh, and uh, Sister Glenda asked us to, they have young children. They should, they've got young children. Pray for that family. Uh, I know pray. There was somebody else I, I don't want to miss. Um, Daniel uh, had said something about Billy uh, uh, Billy Bar, Bar and you, he works for Bill, and uh, he's he's sick and pray for him. Uh, I know we shared requests in our life groups. Pray for those. There's needs in our faith family. Pro, folks are still away, uh, sick, or uh, they're sheltering in place because they've got they want to get the flu and things. But pray for folks to be able to come back as God gives them liberty. Pray for folks who have been guests here. Pray for God to use us to love on them. And tell them about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Uh, let me close and I'll give thanks. Uh, come around. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you. At the end of the service, let's greet and welcome uh, Rex and Brenda into our faith family. Father, thank you so much for the day. Thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for the food and all the hands that prepared it as we celebrate as a faith family. And remember the birth, the arrival, the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless the food to our bodies. We thank you for the Spirit of God and His presence today. We thank you for the mercy and the grace that we've sung about and preached about and taught about. I pray, God, help us be instruments of grace in our world 
We love you, praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 Your liberty, your dismiss, food's over there. Dig right in. Come join us. We'll have a great time today. That's right. No, not at all.